Today's lecture is by Dr. Yoga Gabura. Yoga is a professor within the School of Pharmacy and the School of Medicine at the University of Maryland. Between 1999 and 2011, he held various positions at the FDA, and under his leadership, the Division of Pharmacometrics was formed. Yoga is a world-recognized scientific leader in the area of quantitative disease models and their applications to decisions. He is best known for transforming the field of pharmacometrics across the world into a decision support science. Yoga earned a Bachelor of Pharmacy and a Master's Degree from Barilla Institute of Technology and Science in India. He received a PhD in pharmaceutical science from North Dakota State University and then received an MBA from Johns Hopkins. Please enjoy the following lecture. Hi, my name is Joga Guburu. I'm a faculty at uh, the School of Pharmacy, University of Maryland. Before joining the university about six years ago, I spent uh, quite a number of years at the FDA and uh, my experience in the realm of pharmacometrics and um, it stems from the need to contribute to drug development and regulatory uh, decisions. So it's all applied as far as I'm concerned um, in terms of PKPD modeling. So what I have done is that we can briefly go over the concept of um, modeling and then I'm going to present to you two case studies perhaps that should uh, give you a flavor about the applications of the um, PKPD modeling. The underlying premise, the underlying brains of PKPD modeling can be summarized in what is called as quantitative disease drug trial models. So there are three components here, disease, drug, and trial model. Disease, the, the, these three models have the input in terms of the data that is collected from experimentation in the lab or clinical trial uh, data, efficacy, safety, pharmacokinetics, and risk factors, they all constitute the data. And then you also have um, previously available literature through, uh, uh, through, through journals um, and other sources. And then you, 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 we have diverse expertise in terms, in terms of the domain expertise, meaning we have experts who understand the biology, the pathophysiology, the pharmacology, um, the clinical signs and symptoms. All that knowledge is also important for developing these disease drug trial models. Then in terms of the, the, the each of the three components, disease models generally pertain to un quantifying the biology, which is the biomarker outcome relationships. For example, we have, uh, for example, we have, uh, we, let's say we're dealing with cancer. Uh, there is a, like a solid, solid tumor. Uh, the size of the tumor and mortality are correlated. So a patient in general, qualitative terms, a patient who has a bigger tumor is likely to survive less compared to a patient who has a smaller tumor. But then how do we quantify that? That's what the disease model is about. Same thing with respect to change in glucose and how does that affect change in HbA1c and how does that affect the uh, probability or the risk of myocardial infarction, retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy, and you know that that those constitute biomarker outcome relationships you also have a, a natural progression if you're dealing with uh, either cancer or for example neurodegenerative diseases you have parkinson's disease for example or alzheimer's or multiple sclerosis these diseases they progress over time and um, capturing the the trend and the variability, the mean and the variability of this natural progression 
also impo is important in um, designing clinical trials in anticipating what kind of a effect a magnitude of drug effect would constitute be meaningful and such and then the placebo response so you have disease states uh, such as major depressive disorder the placebo response itself is very big so how do we quantify that and the variability are there risk factors or can you use um, some kind of a baseline characteristic to uh, to to enrich your population as uh, um, super responders versus uh, versus uh, non responders to placebo and uh, so there is reason for or motivation for us to appreciate or quantify disease models drug model is pretty much it's it's been something that we have focused on in the past 50 years for sure um, this constitutes the pharmacology so we are very proficient in understanding the relationship between dose and concentration and concentration and the uh, efficacy or safety markers be it biomarkers outcomes um, and and such we also know how to correlate or translate that's what these days it's called translational research the findings in a petri dish to findings in a animal model and then findings in healthy subjects versus patients so we have uh, qualitative relationships and then there are cases where you develop quantitative relationships that can project based upon healthy uh, subjects what happens in patients or in animal models and what happens in patients so these kinds of pharmacology based models we are very familiar with and that is going to be the topic of this of this lecture the third component of the disease drug trial model is the trial model which is often ignored you take a any of these uh, clinical trial publications table 1 is pretty much the inclusion exclusion criteria the baseline factors age body weight uh, number of males number of females and and the disease uh, uh, disease uh, status at the at the entry into the trial and such right so those are usually univariate you give they give you the mean median and a range perhaps or a standard deviation and uh, these are univariate analysis but we really do not know if you take a parkinson's patient the from that table whether the baseline um, updrs score that's the score used to to uh, measure symptoms in parkinson's patients whether that score at baseline is correlated with the age or age since diagnosis uh, or you know uh, or any other um, pre pre treatments that the patient has gone through so that kind of a multivariate uh, quantitative analysis is required it's not a luxury but it is required really if you want to design a future trial you want to perform simulations you need to know those relationships the other thing we don't pay attention to is dropouts so this has to do with two things one understanding why the patients drop out we we are more concerned about how to deal with it statistically but we don't pay attention to why the patient dropped out and two is there anything we can do to uh, uh, to minimize dropouts discontinuations meaning is it because patients um, have some kind of a uh, adverse event that they that's why they discontinued or they feel they have completely cured of the disease that they are that they are dropping out of the study understanding those using quantitative approaches is important for us to write individualized dosing algorithms and compliance this is a major problem i think i don't think we even know how to measure compliance uh, there are some methods but uh, they have not made it into mainstream that we can routinely look at compliance meaning is the patient taking the um the treatment as prescribed the are they skipping treatment uh, doses or are they skipping or are they uh, um, 
taking the, the medication at a different time than they were supposed to. These all contribute to the understanding of uh, the therapeutic properties of, of the drug as well as patient behavioral characteristics. So all these three together is the all these three components together constitutes uh, quantitative drug uh, disease drug trial um, uh, models. Okay, we will focus on drug model uh, for the rest of this lecture. Let us start with a case study of a drug that acts on the HPG axis. So hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. We know that uh, in the in the brain, hypothalamus is responsible for the pulsatile GnRH release almost every two hours. The release is pulsatile, meaning it goes up and down like spikes, exactly like what is shown on the slide then that stimulates the, the secretion or formation of two hormones, luteinizing hormone LH and FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. And then, a, and, and, the, and in the testes is responsible for the for formation of testosterone. So, and then excessive levels of testosterone send a negative feedback to the hypothalamus to go easy on the GnRH release. So this is a, um, a tightly regulated a homeostatic bio, biological or physiological uh, phenomenon. And what happens in cancer patients is there is a, a there is a excessively high levels of testosterone, and those patients who are not candidates for surgery or radiation, the, they go through chemical castration. How do they happen? It, there are drugs such as Degarelex which block the GnRH receptor in releasing luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulating hormone, thereby suppressing testosterone levels. So that's the mechanism. Uh, in these prostate cancer patients. Now let's look at the uh, clinical data that is available for PK modeling, actually PK P PD modeling, but let's start with PK. There were three clinical trials. The study one is a single dose 48 hour infusion study, which is placebo controlled, seven parallel treatment groups, very unusual, but that's what it is from and the doses ranging from about one uh, microgram per kilogram to 50 microgram per kilogram, very wide range, 50 fold range, six to nine healthy volunteers, healthy volunteers per group. And there's rich sampling schedule. Study two is a single dose, single dose short infusion study, either 15 or 45 minute infusion, no placebo control, four parallel treatment groups, 1.5, to 30 microgram per kilogram dose. Again, a pretty wide dose range. The third study included a single sub -Q dose. So the study one and study two were uh, intravenous, and this is subcutaneous study, placebo controlled, 11 treatment groups with doses ranging from five to 30 mg flat dose. And we have access to these data for uh, supporting our developing a semi-mechanistic PKPD model. Why do we care? Why, why do we need this? The reason is Degarelix for its approval by US FDA requires that the endpoint meet is uh, the endpoint for, for the approval is such that 90% or more of the patients who received Degarelix in a clinical trial should have suppressed testosterone levels, and there's a threshold for that, 0.5, um, I think, nanograms per deciliter. So you have to meet that threshold suppression from 
day 28 that's one month through the end of the year so that's for for 11 months there has to be a sustained suppression which means you want to get the testosterone lowered as soon as possible that's to do with the onset then two you want a, that level to be sustained through the one year which means you need to come up with a maintenance dose and two uh, and three a dosing interval should this be because it's a sub q injection that's the plan should this be given every week every two weeks every month every three months six months how do we come up with this and as you can appreciate the 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 more frequent the dosing the less likely it's going to be appealing to the patients because you don't want to go to the hospital or the patient doesn't want to go to the hospital probably every every week or every two weeks so you have to balance the the practicality and the and the pharmacology in this case now why do we need modeling why can't you do clinical trials and and then find them out well you can but then you have to wait for one year of trial and different combinations of the loading dose maintenance dose and the dosing interval and that could be pretty costly because these are in prostate cancer patients it's not like you can recruit them on the street um, for your trials okay now i advocate what is called as a dia principle meaning any given project for you you must should you ought to uh, follow dia principle if it were me i would say must dia stands for decisions information and analysis and it is in that order so i have shown you the data but i also explain to you the key questions that are the uh, motivation for pkpd analysis so you will have to write those key questions which are not technical these are decisions that you are to make and then look for the information uh, that is available to be able to uh, support answering the questions and then you design or engineer the analysis um, based on the information and then come up with some decisions then you will have to negotiate with the rest of the team because you will not have answers to every which part of the question so you negotiate um, with the rest of the team it's usually interdisciplinary and then maybe you will have to look for further information and then maybe you have to refine the analysis a little bit so on an average you have to go through the cycle two or three times before you come up with uh, with the with the the final decision to to move forward so that's the dia principle so i really strongly advocate that whenever you start a pharmacometrics project that you adhere to this principle otherwise it becomes an academic exercise that's uh, futile maybe you can get a publication but they, that they won't be any any influence on the on the final decision whatever that is he he read the data this is time on the x axis degradalex plasma concentration on the y axis this is from study 1 48 hour iv infusion as as you see the observed data is shown um, by the symbols squares and the solid um, lines are the population mean predictions meaning this is the average model prediction for over the population and the individual um, predictions are shown in dotted by the dotted line as you can see the model describes the pharmacokinetic data very well what does that mean meaning i can change the rate of input the dose and such and i i would be able to predict the pk profile under different conditions that is the beauty of pharmacokinetics once i know the fundamental pk parameters clearance and volume i can then change the input rate to anything i want and i would i would be able to reproduce or project the pharmacokinetic profile under that uh, new dosing condition this is the uh, this is the sample representative subject from study 2 where the iv infusion is given over 15 minutes it's the same thing you see that the model describes the data very well 
the population mean which is the black solid line is not going to ever perfectly describe the data because it's the mean meaning there will be 50% of the subjects above that line and 50% of the subjects below that line so the individual prediction the dotted line the broken line is what is, signifies that the structural model is accurate and then you do the same exercise for the subcutaneous um, study study 3 and you see that the model describes the data very well now let us look at some key differences between these two if you look at let's let's pay attention to the to the for example the 15 minute iv infusion the time scale there is 2 days the time scale for the sub q is 60 days okay which means the sub q for the sub q administration there is perhaps a depot in the subcutaneous tissue where the drug is released slowly um, or drug is absorbed actually slowly into the system and hence it takes a longer time uh, for the concentrations to decline over 60 days and then this is the reason why subcutaneous would be ideal for the treatment especially when you want the testosterone suppression to be sustained over long periods of time and that you want to keep your frequency of dosing limited or, or, or less okay so the stark difference between sub-Q and the um, and the IV naturally the concentrations the C max for example is much higher for the IV compared to the sub Q but that can be handled with dosing if necessary each study represents unique PK profile due to different dosing regimen and this is the richness when you're developing a new product if there is an opportunity for you to to design or look at different dosing regimens uh, starkly different you should do that because that is where you will learn uh, the the properties of the drug that you can use to extrapolate in the future studies and remember we're only dealing with healthies here you remember this this picture what we did was we converted that biology into a PKPD model now we have compartments the first compartment is GnRH compartment there is a pulse style release with a, uh, a, a zero order formation rate of K release of GnRH and the degradation of the GnRH is represented by a first order rate constant K degradation GnRH, the red box. Then you have the, um, the luteinizing hormone pool and remember the GnRH stimulates the release of a luteinizing hormone into circulation okay so the LH pool already exists and GnRH only stimulates the release it's like switching open the valve uh, for the LH to flow from this pool tank into the systemic circulation so that's why you have the pool compartment and the plasma compartment that's where you sample the plasma and that rate is KRL is a first order rate constant depending upon how much of the drug is available in the pool. Then the, the luteinizing hormone in the plasma is what drives the stimulates the formation of testosterone. And then the, the testosterone, is, the body also degrades the testosterone, uh, eliminates it eventually. Degelelex, it um, counteracts the GnRH in terms of on the LH release into the plasma circulation and that's the uh, mechanism of action. So we we implemented these models in uh, in, a, in a software um, I think we used non-mem and let's see how the model describes the data. The placebo you have time in days and testosterone concentration on the y-axis it's pretty flat placebo there's no action it's pretty flat um, and as the dose increases so you have group B here which is 0.64 micrograms per kilogram this is from study 1 the group E which is about 10 micrograms per kilogram 
and then group F which is about 50 micrograms per kilogram the higher the dose the lower the testosterone suppression or the higher the testosterone suppression okay and the higher the dose the longer the the suppression so look at here at at the uh, the lowest dose group shown here where you have a suppression which occurs about one um, one day and then slowly the testosterone starts coming back in two and a half days starts coming up but then you you look at the 10 microgram per kilogram roughly dose uh, the suppression is sooner and longer uh, because the testosterone reaches the floor sooner and it is even more pronounced in terms of the duration of suppression at the 50 microgram per kilogram this is a classic signature of um, bioflex based pharmacodynamic models the question then becomes we had three studies and they are different dosing regimens but it's the same drug and the range of the exposures are similar uh, and the same biomarkers are, are collected in these healthies so could we have predicted study two results based on model developed using study one so what we did was we took the pk from the study two okay the individual data then we say we'll use the mean data from the study one in terms of the pharmacodynamic parameters and see if we can predict without estimation the pharmacodynamic profiles as you can see here we we, we are able to reproduce the mean uh, profiles at 1.5 through 30 microgram per kilogram dose very very well in spite of the fact that the time course of the pharmacological response you see is distinctly different from the previous study all right then we did the same thing by asking could we have predicted study three results and again the the answer is an overwhelming yes again the signature the time course of the testosterone is completely different from the from study one and study two so that is the power of having a physiologically based pharmacodynamic model that you change the input you can predict the pharmacological response um, for under these different scenarios which may not have been directly studied so you can argue in this case they could have gotten away with only one study instead of doing these three studies now what now we have a model that is pretty robust in terms of the physio physiological basis and two we have done a reasonable testing under uh, i would say vastly different dosing regimens yet the model is robust enough to predict these profiles reliably so i can now use simulations to look at different combinations of loading dose and maintenance dose and dosing interval to narrow down my choices if not pick the one and then go for the clinical trial but unfortunately the company did not do that so what you see on the left hand side let's start with the left hand side you have the study numbers under activity and then the the development years 2001 to 2007 they have conducted five studies the blue the blue um, uh, arrows for example cs02 through cs14 uh, and they have conducted from uh, using anywhere from 80 to about 200 subjects patients that is and yet they did not have a dosing regimen until march 2005 and then at that time based on these analysis and and some other sophisticated analysis they came up with the dosing regimen that was ultimately tested in cs21 with a sample size of 600 patients and then the drug is absu uh, uh, approved after that it's currently approved uh, based upon this type of pkpd modeling so you can argue and perhaps this is a good learning experience for you that you could the company could have 
avoided most of these studies the blue arrow studies and uh, could have gone to market sooner which means higher revenue longer revenue and also for the patients perhaps it's an, another drug available for their consumption all right now let me present to you a different case study this is on the a genetics based pediatric warfarin dosing regimen derived using pharmacometric bridging warfarin is one of the top 5 drugs that is prescribed in us and perhaps the world today yet this drug is not approved for pediatrics and there is some need of this drug in pediatric patients what you see here is uh, from the publication that is shown here so if you want to have more uh, details you should go to that um, to this publication let's go through facts about warfarin pharmacotherapy it's my most widely used uh, anticoagulant more than 50 years in use 1 million prescriptions per year in adults it has a narrow therapeutic index so there is a monitoring of uh, inr which is supposed to be around 2 to 3 if you fail to uh, meet the inr meaning you are below 2 then your risk of thrombotic embolism increases or the thrombus formation and if the inr is you know uh, importantly greater than 3 then the risk of a hemorrhage bleeding is higher okay and we now know which we did not 50 years ago that there are two mutations that govern or contribute to the variability of warfarin that is cyp2c9 poor metabolizers in um, have higher exposures than the um than the uh, extensive metabolizers and then with respect to the vcar c1 it's about the sensitivity of the uh, patient to the same concentration of warfarin so even if you take two different patients extensive and poor poor metabolizers and let's say that you control the concentration to be identical in these two patients yet the patient depending upon the vcar c1 status could have a uh, inr that is off because of potential mutations in vcar c1 allele there is no formal approval in pediatrics and i don't think that anybody would do a study that will support the approval at this time uh, this because it's off patent forever but there is a need in patients with chd cvl wall replacements and more infants than adolescents than children need warfarin but there is very limited clinical data so what do you do when you are dosing pediatrics it's i guess anybody's guess so we wanted to plug that gap and this research is about deriving warfarin peak um, uh, dosing in pediatrics using pkpd um, approach so the what is the but what is the problem you know people should be able to figure out the dosing by trial and error well survey in 2010 of 42 pediatric hematologists who treat pediatric patients with warfarin showed that 92% positive response for need to develop new pediatric dosing regimen because of this problem what you see here is day 0 to day 90 and you see the warfarin dose on the y axis as you can see the recommended daily warfarin dose for a hypothetical 10 year old child weighing 40 kg could be as low as um i want to say 1 or milligram um to more than 10 mg so depending upon who is treating depending on, and and depending upon the variability uh, different patients get different uh, require different doses and this also shows that even on day 0 um you you see a vast range of doses that are used which means the practice also is different depending upon who you see 
So the objective is to derive a potentially useful uh, dosing algorithm based on mechanistic principles and uh, um, of modeling and simulation. So you have, we have very rich prior adult PKPD model. We also know the contribution of the uh, uh, the polymorphism in terms of the metabolism as well as VCOR C1, and we also know the mechanism of how warfarin acts on the anticoagulation system. Then we have pediatric model derivation, which is meaning you would bridge the exposures between pediatrics and adults using uh, body size and you know and uh, ontogeny, the maturation of of uh, liver enzymes. That is also known. We also have real data from pediatrics from the Los Angeles Hospital CHLA uh, to verify if our predictions are reasonable. And then you would do perform simulation. CTS stands for clinical trial simulations to estimate starting dose and come up with a titration algorithm. And and then you would uh, look at the uh, you 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 would we can discuss what happens with that uh, with that dosing algorithm. All right. This is the picture in terms of therapeutic index. Uh, two to three is widely accepted. There is some gray zone or pink zone in this case about where the bleeding risk starts. I think it's 3.5 and above and gradually the bleeding risk starts um, to increase and below two there is uh, um, risk of thrombus formation and usually in clinical trials in adults you see that the therapeutic goal is to have at least 60 percent within the therapeutic window um, by two weeks and there would be less than 10 percent of patients who would be above 3.5 uh, and less than 20 percent who would have INR of less than 2. This has been the empirical observation in clinical trials among adults. We know the pharmacokinetic model which is there is a first order absorption to the plasma, there is distribution into the tissue and then elimination from the body. C free is the concentration and the free concentration that elicits the action on the anticoagulation um, synthesis and the pharmacodynamic model is provided here which the PCA in this case uh, will translate into changes in the INR and then for the for the metabolism clearance and volume clearance you would have the effect of CYP2C9 genotype and for the IC50 for the pharmacodynamic model you would have the influence of the haplotype VCR C1 on on the IC50 so patients some patients would have um, uh, higher IC50 meaning less sensitive to the drug and some patients would have a um, lower IC50 which means they are sensitive relatively more sensitive to the drug there was a separate trial I don't want to go into that but this model was used to design the dosing regimen for that trial before the trial was conducted and as you can see the the um, uh, observed and the model predicted data uh, purple and the gray are pretty consistent um, for INR less than 2, 2 to 3 and greater than 3.5. So which shows that the adult model was prospectively validated from this clinical trial in adults. This was conducted by Harvard. Um, and then we know that if you looked at related anticoagulants, the exposure response, dose response, concentration response in terms of for example here anti-factor 10A for heparin and low molecular weight heparins LMWHS the adults and pediatric data are highly overlapping as you can see here the, um, the filled symbols versus the hollow symbols they follow the same trend in terms of higher the concentration um, higher the effect on anti-factor 10A so this means that Pharmacologically, there is no difference between pediatrics and adults. So as long as I can scale the dose such that I can manage the same concentrations in adults and pediatrics, I should not be expecting a different INR changes for a given concentration in pediatrics 
compared to adults. And that is also shown for this direct thrombin inhibitor ergotroban, um, where you have ergotroban concentrations all the way from, uh, shall we say, one microgram per ml to, to 10,000. It's, uh, you know, five orders of magnitude, an unbelievable range of concentrations. And on the y-axis, you see APTT in seconds. And blue and the red are the adults and pediatrics. They, are, they follow the same trend in terms of the data. In fact, the adults are healthy here, and the pediatrics are patients. In spite of that, they still follow the same relationship in terms of the uh, pharmacology, the exposure response. Um, OK, so then the PD model is basically the same as adults and the pharmacokinetic model the relation the relationship meaning the the difference would be to bring in body weight to to scale the clearance and volume and the effect of age because we're going all the way to neonates um, in terms of the uh, antigeny of cyp 2 c9 which is also published in the literature so you take the allometric scaling and the ontogeny model and we already have the PD model that was actually developed by us at, a, at an earlier point and, and, and other researchers also. You pool all these different sub-models together to start predicting the um, outcomes or INR at different dosing schemes in pediatrics. We do have the observed data also from 26 subjects. This is very hard to get data in terms of warfarin and pediatrics. And the dosing was empirical. Basically, every investigator decided how to dose that kid um, by themselves. There were no protocols or whatever to follow per se. Uh, the age range is four months to 18 years, and the body weight ranged from seven to 84 kilograms. And the target INR, the two to uh, 2.5, was about 5, 1.5 to 2.5 was 13 of them, and 2.5 to 3.5 was 8. Why do we have a different cut for the INR? That is how they, they looked at INR in, in, this, in this observational study. And um, naturally, because you have only 26, all the genotypes and haplotypes are not going to be represented. So for example, you have CYP2C9, star 1, star 1, which is the the... Uh, wild type, 80% of them, uh, the patients are of that, and star 1, star 2 is about 10%. There is no kid who was among these very rare mutations like star 3, star 3. And in terms of the weaker C1 genotype, they are pretty evenly distributed, one third each, G, 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 A, and A. What we did was, we used the model for the, the adult extrapolated pediatric model, meaning we did not subject that model through the data or the, we did not subject the pediatric data, CHLA data, through the model. So it was kind of a prediction of what happens if we predicted the outcomes, uh, the INR uh, results from the pediatrics and then see if the pediatric CHLA study gave you similar range of exposure uh, INRs. So what you see here is the, the predictions, the black lines are the median predictions because you can never predict without some data from each individual that, in, that patient's data. It's just impossible um, uh, because of variability. So we mm, re repeated simulations for what, in other words, if you recruited 100 subjects like ID16, like ID23, like ID10, like ID29, you, did, you exactly recruited such match, matching patients um, and 100 of them, and you gave the same dosing to all of them. This is the best or uh, the mean INR profile you'll find. That's the black line. And the red lines are the fifth and the 95th percentiles of these um, virtual 100 kids. Okay, then let's sprinkle the data. The model, by and large, uh, describes the, the data pretty well, except in some instances. We wanted to show you both good and, and not so good 
predictions like the lower ones id 10 and 29 they are not so good but 16 and 23 pretty good um, so we counted based upon this kind of a visual display 80 percent 20 of the 26 followed the the predictions were on dot for 20 percent six of the 26 the predictions did not follow the uh, the, the, the predictions did not follow the observations. Why is that? That's because um, there was uh, the records here, observational study for several of these six of 26 uh, were not straight, meaning the INR, as you can see for these two patients was low, but if you looked at the charts, the dosing, they kept increasing the doses. So it's not clear uh, how this can happen in spite of increasing the doses, the, the INR starts dwindling down. Um, so that part is, is not clear. Uh, so so it's, we, don't, we cannot say that the model doesn't predict the data very well. Um, perhaps there is some, uh, uh, some of this can be attributed to poor records. Uh, I'm not saying that just to justify uh, and defend a model. Uh, but 80% uh, of the subjects, it was very good in terms of the prediction. So, and these are the six who had questionable records. So it is possible that the model is not uh, as bad as it may seem if you only looked at these two subjects. CHLA dosing led to poor INR control, as you can see here, which actually let's look at only this graph. The, the time days 5 to 14, 15 to 21, 22 to 30 are shown on the x-axis and percent of the patients, uh, of the total INRs measured uh, in, the, in, in the range and outside, below and outside the range are shown here. The green is good, meaning within the target, which is about 35% and it goes in to about 50% uh, uh, only after day 22. The patients who are below the target are about 50%, um, you know, roughly, and then they go down to about 35 by, by, by week three. The number of patients who have higher uh, uh, INRs increase over time from five to a tad over 10% in three weeks. So by and large, if you compare it with the adult trials, this is a poor INR control. And if you, if you parse the data based upon genotypes, you can see that some genotypes have worse outcomes compared to the others, but the numbers are small. So I don't want to spend too much time on that. Then we have the model and the model performs reasonably well. So we, we simulated uh, pediatric data under different dosing regimens and then looked at the output of INR. Those are the demographics, age one month to 17 years, weight five to eight kilograms, and then we simulated a thousand kids per genotype. So per genotype would be six variations in 2C9, three variations in VCAR C1, which is 18 variations times 1,000, 18,000 kids. And look at how many of these subjects met the target um, INR. Okay, the same principle here, two to three is what we want. Um, I'll skip that, uh, it's just to narrow down the, the, the dosing, um, dosing scheme. And we found that it is best to separate out less than 20 versus 20 and greater body in based on body size kilograms um, because you cannot get a same per kilogram dose for all of them because the allometric scaling, the body weight clearance relationship is curvilinear. So you will not be ever be able to get one per kilogram dose for uh, uh, the full range of five to 80 kilogram patients. So we made it into kind of two linear mg per kilogram is linear, right? mg per kilogram, two lines, uh, below 20, above 20. And that's the titration scheme. Then um, 
we found and we simulated both genotype based and genotype independent dosing and as you can see the, just by looking at the two panels on the on the uh, right hand side genotype based and the left hand side genotype independent the greens are taller you don't need to look at anything else the greens are taller and the reds are smaller the reds are larger on the left hand side so by this you can conclude that genotype based dosing is more appropriate in terms of therape achieving therapeutic success so um, now there are some challenges the lowest strength administered in pediatrics is 0.5 milligrams that too you crush the tablet and you give it with apple sauce because these kids cannot swallow tablets and success of the proposed dosing because some of these doses we assumed dosing is not an issue but it is an issue in practical in practice so there has to be some other formulation but then who is going to do this because nobody is going to make money out of that probably um, in conclusion um, f this is to our best knowledge first reproducible scientifically based pediatric warfarin dosing regimen and there is successful use of prior information bridging from adults to pediatrics this is the other thing mechanistic models allow using prior data efficiently if all you had is a p-value there's no actually there's no utility of p-value other than just looking at it and then maybe celebrating it and then you, you're done with it there's no carryover of knowledge from from that and we took advantage of the pharmacogenomic advance advances and and the proposed dosing perhaps should be studied in a clinical trial and maybe um, they we should think about coming up with a pediatric friendly uh, formulation if possible and uh, uh, that's it folks so so in essence what is pharmacometrics what is pkpd modeling pharmacometrics is not about number crunching it's a culture of disciplined decision making you are taking all the available information you are using making the best use of it to guide the, the next research sometimes you do not have to do clinical trials again meaning if i were to treat a, a, a patient that i know i care about um, uh, pediatrics i would go with the recommendations that i've shown you before i don't need to wait till i see a clinical trial um, because i have confidence in the pkpd of of warfarin and the knowledge that we accrued so far so with that i would uh, uh, end this talk thank you very much